Welcome to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast, addressing all aspects of the digital enterprise, inspiring connection without boundaries and creation without limits. Thank you for tuning in. Here are your hosts, Tom Singer and Craig Brown. Well, hello there, and welcome to another episode of the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. Thank you so much for coming along on the journey of this show that we designed to be a resource for those who work in and around PLM. The Digital Enterprise Society, it is a forum for the exchange of ideas surrounding the tools, processes, and practices used across the product lifecycle. To learn more, visit digitalenterprisesociety.org. My name is Tom Singer, and I have the honor to co-host this show, gosh, for about a year now, with Craig Brown, an industry veteran and former former PLM leader at General Motors. Hey, hey, Craig, how are you today? I'm great. It's good to hear your voice again. Looking forward to our interview today. Awesome. Well, today, like all days, because every single week we try to bring to this podcast interesting interviews and other ideas that are going to help our listeners enhance and grow their careers. And today I'm excited because today we have with us Tom Gill. And he is a senior consultant at SimData, and he advises manufacturing companies and engineering software companies on how to better design their products. So I think we're going to have a really exciting conversation today. So Tom Gill, welcome to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. Thanks, Tom. Good to be here. We're glad to have you. So could you give us a little bit of your background, sort of where did you get started and and what led you to SimData? All right. Well, I... uh... Graduated from University of Maine with a degree in mechanical engineering back in the 80s. I worked for a few years as a design engineer uh, on machine design and started using uh, Unigraphics 1 back in the day. Uh, I evolved from that into doing programming uh, against Unigraphics to customize it. For uh, any of you old timers, you might remember the programming language GRIP. Um, I moved on from that and uh, started to get involved more with engineering analysis, did some FEA, uh, then got involved with system administration, which led to PLM, managing CAD data to managing files and other engineering data. Uh, Became a PLM director at an automotive tier one supplier for about 14 years. And then about 10 years ago, um, in the uh, middle of the Great Recession, I moved over to SimData to uh, work as a consultant and take advantage of the, or I'll say spread the knowledge I gained from my uh, industry career and help out uh, both solution providers and industrial companies. Thanks, Tom. Um, You know, you and I have had the chance to, to meet virtually, thanks to COVID. We we uh, both have roles at SimData where we were part of this year's market industry forum, and I I was pleased to hear you chat about a couple of topics that that I think people don't understand, and that's one of the reasons I wanted you on as a guest today. So uh, the first one's around agile, and um, I have my own background in agile and the methods. I worked for a software company in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, for a few years, and um, just as that was coming to light. <clears throat> and I get it, but I think a lot of listeners don't. Could, could you give us your summary of what, what is Agile and maybe how is it different than other kinds of engineering? Um, Agile has been around for a long time. You can think of it as incremental development and in that you put out a product uh, and then improve it. So continuous improvement similar to manufacturing theories like lean manufacturing. Um, so I, I think there you could go back into the 60s, 70s, and 80s and find examples of incremental releases. Well, in, car, car guys would, you were in the automotive, industry, car guys would claim they've always been that way. Well, the <laughs> they, software- they, they, they always okay. increment, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, software is a little different in okay. that where you don't have a physical product, you can output a new version or a new prototype, if you will, um, very quickly in a matter of days, weeks. Right. Um, But in 2000, this concept of 
uh, extreme programming uh, evolved into Agile when the Agile Manifesto was published. And you can go to agilemanifesto.org. And it's a, a very simple document that describes user-centric programming. The idea is that you put out working increments of software uh, on, a on a relatively fixed cadence that are, provide value. And then you collect feedback from the users and adjust your uh, strategy for the next release. Uh, the big thing is that you adapt to changes. The, mm -hmm. the historical opposite is a very uh, deeply planned project, maybe more like a, uh, an aerospace program or a, a, an astro-type program, um, the Apollo mission, something like that, mm -hmm. where you plan everything in extreme detail uh, because you you basically have one shot to get it right. right. In the case of software, you can change it relatively easily and keep uh, honing in on the um, on the solution. The uh, the important thing though with software is it can take a long time to get a complete working system out, and lots of things change. Right. Um, so by not having to um, meet this target long in the distance, you have the opportunity to adjust your process and change and continue to provide value along the way. So, so when you say software here, I just want to clarify, you, you mean also well, tool vendors for sure, and checking with us as tool users that we're getting what we want, but you're also talking about embedded software, uh, the software in a car or the software in an aircraft, right? They're, they're yes. both using the I mean, same- I think uh, the the Agile Manifesto really came out uh, of the open source movement. Although mm -hmm. I would probably need to be fact checked there, um, it was it's uh, been adopted by commercial software organizations for a long time now, mm -hmm. and I would say over the last ten years, probably maybe even a bit less than that it's hit the enterprise software or the, the implementation of commercial software in industry. Um, so now, can you take these, this Agile manifesto and apply it to mechanical engineering? And, and I'm thinking about the frequency of release, right? But a lot of mechanical folks are, are driven with whatever their capital investment schedules are, and so that tends to be months because you've got to build fixtures and machines to make machines, right? Um, on the other hand, so, you know, the idea of doing it in weeks or even days sounds crazy until you start talking about additive. So what I'm curious, will these agile processes work for mechanical engineering? There are elements of agile that work for physical products as mm -hmm. opposed to, uh, I'll call them virtual or software type products. Um, the hard part with a mechanical product is when you have to come together with a physical prototype that is very similar to a waterfall event. Certainly uh, uh, rapid prototyping type techniques like additive manufacturing mm -hmm. um, help you to uh, achieve those milestones. But can you get something working that delivers value in a, in a short increment of time? I think is the the key, but there's a lot of different elements. Like you hear terms uh, like stand up and retrospective, and those mm -hmm. types of things uh, do get baked into uh, any type of project, not just a mechanical. Could be construction. Right, right. I was gonna say I, I remember the term. I don't even know where it came from. After action reviews, right? So either after a build event or after a, a road test, we would take. Um, we would, it was a formal process, right? You would have an action after, you know, after action review to understand what did we just learn? And, and have we applied that to our product strategy or our test strategy? So that's interesting. Now, this frequency of release of mechanical systems versus software systems, but they all kind of come together to make a aircraft or, or a car. Um, to me, they, they all have a, a way to configure or can you know manage a list of parts that go in? We we call that a bill of materials. 
Another topic you wrote about and, and you've been teaching people about is is something you call X bomb. But if I go back before that for a second, we have multi bombs. Uh, part of it's the release frequency. Part of it's the knowledge you have about a particular domain. What what do you see happening with with multi bombs? I mean, how do we manage them? How do we keep them in sync? Um, wouldn't it be cool if we just had a single bomb? But that that then breaks apart with all the release uh, frequency issues, right? So what te teach us about X bomb and why why it matters? Um, X bomb matters because your information is connected across the life cycle. Um, if you uh, I'll start the life cycle with requirements, which drive engineering, which drives design, which drives manufacturing, which drives in-service operation. So if you have a product and you have all that information and it's linked, you know uh, the this part in manufacturing is satisfying these design requirements, mm -hmm. which is satisfying this customer requirement. So if your customer requirement changes, you potentially know what design elements need to change, what manufacturing elements need to change, and what service elements need to change. That's an uh, in in the PLM world that would typically be called impact analysis. And and is that maintained in a database or in a bunch of Excel spreadsheets or napkins? Um, the the latest technology to address um, impact analysis and, and mm -hmm. more fundamentally traceability is to use a platform approach. Okay. A platform could be a single database, although typically it's very hard across an enterprise to get a single tool set that can satisfy anyone, everyone's requirements. So the platform approach enables you to connect multiple databases and the, the term we like to use is single logical source of truth. It looks mm -hmm. like a, a single system, but it really can be multiple interconnected systems. And yeah. that's a lot of the what multi-bomb is potentially is today or how it's implemented. So, so are you saying the, the human being needs to know how to go to those different um, databases or is it somehow uh, hidden from them in their interface layer? Their, their user experience layer, if you will. Yeah, in general, they would be uh, in the best condition, in the best situations, they would be hidden and it appears as a single tool set uh, in the, uh, the user's tool of choice. So if you're in a mechanical system, you would be able to see the electronic, at least the physical end of the electronic parts uh, as if they were in your mechanical system. Or if you're a, a bomb type person, you would, from your bomb, you can view the mechanical and electronic components in as bomb type elements. So I remember uh, early 2000s where the role I had then was, was managing a supplier of electronic parts. And it was interesting, the trouble we had from the geometry of the controller was in Unigraphics or some version of that, right? but the wiring harness and all the rest was in yet another set of tools. And the digital circuitry was in a third set of tools. And it was really a human that knew both tools that was drawing two models, some of them in two dimensions, some of them in three dimensions, in order to keep the design in sync so that the different areas, you know, packaging the controller in the car versus the wiring harness versus the actual, you know, embedded microprocessors and embedded software, this per that's all this person did. I didn't feel like they did any design work. All I thought they were doing was uh, literally the human glue between two databases. It, it's kind of frustrating. That's yeah, it's 20 years ago. Surely that's improved, right? Surely there's a way to do that now that's more automatic. The technologies uh, certainly exist, but... <laughs> you're, you're being careful, <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> But the reality is it's a people process and technology problem. Mm -hmm. um, we generally at SimData like to say you, you've got to balance all three, but technology uh, 
processes need to be designed that people can use, mm -hmm. and then the technology needs to make it easy to happen. Um, yeah, I've, I've been a strong believer that things like, um, well, there's an acronym OSLC, and that's a whole nother discussion probably, but the point about if, uh, if my requirements are managed in a tool like doors and my um, mechanical design is in a tool like NX and my test operations and my embedded software are you know, yet another set of tools, <laughs> I, I as a system engineer want to be able to look at all of that, right? I want to be able to dive in where there's a problem and, and figure out is it software, is it a mechanical part? Um, Maybe we need to repartition the requirements, right? That traceability you talked about earlier. I, I, I'm woefully disappointed in the state of tool vendors, but a lot of times, you know, in companies when management gets involved, and I was one of those guys for a while, we're like, well, just use the best tools we can find that meet most of the people and the rest of you. Um, if you, if you're impacted, so be it. Even that doesn't work. Those folks work around the system the ones that feel most impact, just because they know, and maybe I, I'm just thinking, maybe it's back to the Agile Manifesto, they know that it, it, it you know, doing that extra step of, of uh, bureaucracy doesn't help them at all. And so they would rather do the dual entry I was mentioning earlier, so that they have the freedom during their, their development cycle to use the best tool for their area. Anyways, my point is, I don't think we'll get to single tool vendors, I'd be surprised. Um, and it's partly because of the way innovation happens. People are innovating all the time, and, and it includes process innovations. Um, you, you mentioned this point about um, what we say at, at SimData about process, people, and technology. Which one comes first? Or is there a natural best way to approach this? Is it the people skills? Is it the process? You know, as a tool, um, I always thought it was the tools, but I, I think I'm wrong. <laughs> uh, well, it, it certainly, I take a different viewpoint than a okay. lot of technologists in that I think the tools are, are really pretty good, having been around them my whole career. They, they certainly, uh, the technology certainly delivers on the promises that were made 30 years ago. Uh, you can connect data, you can get a very good idea if your product is going to work without actually building it. Mm -hmm. um, um, but the problem in most companies, and if you had a green field, maybe you can make it work pretty well. Um, but most companies aren't a green field. They're all brown fields. Yeah. I mean, that there's legacy processes. You've got all kinds of different, uh, um, people issues, uh, human, uh, human resources, kinds of things, job descriptions, um, just people in general, the, uh, the, their personalities, how uh, no one likes to change. Even uh, uh, the funniest thing is to try to get someone who's a change management person to try to do something different. <laughs> yeah, 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 they just want to inform and, and tell you how bad it is. <laughs> yeah, um, but uh, um, I think that change, uh, getting the, uh, an organization to change is an evolution and to tie, to tie it back to agile you that's a good way to do it you make incremental improvements mm -hmm. um one of the things I, I harp on a lot with agile though is uh, it can be used well since it's all incremental you don't need to plan uh, <laughs> the, yeah i've heard that <laughs> yeah and the the my response to that is yes you absolutely have to have a a vision a strategy and tactics um but the the vision of where you want to go you you may never get there but you keep incrementing towards it by uh, executing your strategy you may have some uh, twists and turns along the way but you're continually moving in that direction until it doesn't make sense, and then you adapt a little bit. Um, uh, yeah. But the idea that you just go willy nilly doesn't doesn't make sense either. And so you're continue. There's always you're always when in the tools and systems world, even if you can uh, get your organization hammered down to a single set of tools, you're going to end up getting acquired or 
acquiring some, someone else, or right. there'll be a major shift in strategy, like subtractive to additive manufacturing that forces something very different to happen. So right. maintaining that agility to be able to move forward and not uh, just keep trying to do good, not perfect, um, um, will give you more success in the long run, I think. So, so one of the things that, that you touched on, let's explore that a little more. The, the organization has people, the people have experience, knowledge, right? And in some cases, it really is your competitive advantage. I think this resistance to change might be defended by the folks that know that, that experience that makes us better than our competitor across town. On the other hand, it's really hard to sift out that really useful competitive advantage from the, that's the way we've always done it and we've got high quality and we don't wanna change the way we've always done it. I mean, it, it's really hard, and, and I guess I'm doing this for the benefit of the audience, it's really hard to just sift out the difference, right? And I, my advice to tool vendors has always been, well, you should spend time studying it. Is it just a resistance because they don't want to change because it's not their, their invention? Or is there a corporate competitive advantage behind the scenes? And when there is a competitive advantage, well, maybe you, you mentioned platforms earlier. That might be the best answer because you're probably not going to change that process. You just got to integrate with it. You might bring a new kind of database or a, a new kind of, uh, you know, this whole world of analytics that's coming at us, data analytics. We used to do that with human beings. Now we're going to do it with machines. Okay, that's, that's kind of cool. On the other hand, there's knowledge about how you make decisions is still really important. So I don't know. I, I think the, the people side is really hard. We, we maybe need to subdivide it in a few, like resistant to change just because they are tired of learning versus nope they really know the corporate secret the competitive advantage and don't want to give it up or um they're worried the computers will make their jobs obsolete i mean there there is fear right people are worried they're that what they've done forever won't be needed anymore and there there's some evidence of that i i, I think really good engineers don't worry about that at all actually because you're just on to the next challenge <laughs> well, certainly good engineers don't um i had a couple of experiences I'll say back in the 90s. Um, one, when I, I was doing funnet element analysis for window seals, and I worked with this engineer who made, he used to cut out 2D cross sections uh, in rubber, and he would, he would sort of sketch up a shape that he thought would work, and these things are, looked a lot like ink blots. Uh, with extruded <laughs> right. rubber, if you think of the trim around uh, the rubber window seal that it's stuffed up in your door that the glass rides into, that's that's what we were making. So it's an interesting ho whole nother topic, but um, he would cut them out at five times size of a sheet of rubber and he would push and trim with a knife until he thought he got a, a shape that he liked. And then we would cut a one to one extrusion die of that shape and do a physical test. As we started doing FEA, or we, he'd had FEA for a while, and I, when I got involved because of my programming background, I was able to speed it up dramatically. Sure. So I essentially put him out of the business of cutting out these rubber cross sections. He used to try to get them right and then do the analysis to confirm, and right. it became much easier just to do it. So right. the old process was just obsoleted. Um, and then related to that uh, same company, when stereolithography first came out, mm -hmm. but, or just before, before it came out, we used to make wooden models of these 3D blended rubber corners. And then once, and we'd cut cross sections through CAD models. And when stereolithography came out, we made um, uh, the, the SLA parts, and the, this whole industry of wooden model makers that would build these uh, mm -hmm. wooden models of the cross sections just disappeared in about a couple of years. So, uh, so whose job is it to find those two folks more work? I mean, or is it their job to realize what they used to do through a, a very crafty hand-built thing uh, isn't needed anymore, so they better go learn another skill? Um, Who's, whose job is it? 
Uh, that, that probably gets into a political discussion more than that. <laughs> I didn't uh, say who funded it. I just said whose job is it? <laughs> well, it, it is a, uh, your job to look out for yourself and make sure your skills well, are yeah. staying up to date? Or is probably. it someone's responsibility to keep you trained and keep you, you know? Yeah, and it's, and, a, and bit it's, of, it's a bit of both. You don't want to be told. Both. Yeah, you don't want to be told you can't invest in training. I mean, that's just short sighted of whoever's making that call. Yeah, um, and and there's always knowledge to be taken advantage of, and and that that was the cool thing with this guy that was making the window seals was it, it just uh, he took to it like like a fish to water. It, it, he saw that it was a better way to go forward, and we just obsoleted the old process. Well, and to his credit, he probably no longer the critical path, right? He was no longer the constraint on the organization for at yes. least that piece of the process. And I yeah. I think that maybe that's a bit of advice to everybody listening. If you're on the constraint, you should embrace these new technologies because chances are they'll move the constraint, right? The, we, we've had a lot of interviews on here about theory of constraints and moving the moving the bottleneck around, right? If, if you're the bottleneck because of some manual process, computers are pretty amazing what they can do. They can also mislead you, but but when shown a, a working example, you should should take it on. So, anyways, this has been interesting, Tom. We we could chat more, but I think we're reaching our time limit. So, Mr. Singer, it's back to you. Thank you, and thank you, Tom, very much for joining us here on the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. Before I let you go, I I, I want to go a little bit deeper. We we sort of touched on the end, like who's responsible for their own career? Is is your employer responsible? Are you responsible? I always like to take this back when we have someone like you on the show to some career advice. So a lot of the people who listen, they're, they're trying to grow their careers. So what, what can they do? What, what's your basic career advice for people as they look out to the future? Um, keep learning. I mean, it, it, it's simple, but, uh, and under, uh, know what the people upstream and downstream from you do. The more you understand about the adjacencies, more opportunities you'll get to uh, perhaps go higher within your organization to be in, in charge of more or to uh, develop technologies or new ways. If you know what's be, how data, how your output is being consumed, you might be able to make your output more valuable. If you understand what, where your input's coming from, you may be able to make some suggestions so that your job goes easier and all that's good. It's good for your company and it's typically good for you. We've always said, if you're smart enough to automate your own job, we've got something else for you to do. <laughs> that's interesting. That's hey, a, that's you know, one, one other, one other point, you know, we're in these COVID-19 days and um, Tom, I've gotten to know you over the last six months. Um, have you been impacted by COVID-19 or, or do you have some guidance for us on, how to work without going to an office? It's um, a leading question, I realize, but yeah. I know the answer, but we'll let you answer. Yeah, at, at SimData, we, uh, we're consultants, so we, we work from home and we travel. Um, when we work with software and solution providers, we typically work remote uh, using the, the typical tools like GoToMeeting or Zoom. Uh, and lots of email and uh, different communication technologies. With industrial companies, we would typically go on site for a few days have uh, to run workshops and then come back and uh, crunch data, develop designs, and then occasionally present results. We do, we do occasionally do some remote work for workshops, or we have in the past over the years. It, but it's tougher for the industrial companies that haven't worked this way. Mm -hmm. um, but they do seem to be coming around based on our conversations with them. It's, it's a skill that they have to learn. And you can't do everything remote, but um, I think if you're uh, in an industrial company, try, uh, try to do something remote that you haven't done remote before. Or if there's something you think you can't do remote, get your team together and see if you can figure out how to get it done or yeah, what, it, what are simplify it down to the very kernel that 
that can't be done, and then maybe you have to figure out something else for that. Yeah, and, I, and you and I are a good example. We we got assignments on this this annual uh, market forecasting thing, and we were looking forward to to getting together in in New England to to present some of those results back in March, mm-hmm. and then all all things broke apart. <laughs> And, yeah. and it was just last week that we finally did the virtual event for that client. But but in fact, um, you can get a lot of work done uh, working from your home. You got to manage other stuff. But um, there's still a few times, especially if you got an enterprise where you build something, a physical thing, right? Um, it's one thing to see a virtual model of it. It's still better to go for a drive every now and then, at least if you're in the car business. So it, it's been an interesting challenge these last months. So. Thanks again for being our guest today, and I look forward to the next conversations. So, Great. So Tom Gill, Senior Consultant at SimData. If somebody wanted to find out more about you or about SimData, where would they go? Um, I'm available on LinkedIn. And uh, if you go to simdata.com, C-I-M-D-A-T-A, uh, you can check out our company and maybe we can get a chance to work at some, t- some point in the future. Awesome. Well, again, thanks for being with us today. And thank you for everybody who tuned in. Uh, We're going to be back next week. We hope you will join us every single week where we're going to have more thoughts, ideas, and information in and around product lifecycle management. The Digital Enterprise Society is the place for the exchange of ideas around digital manufacturing tools. Check us out at digitalenterprisesociety.org. You've been listening to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. Learn more about what you've heard here today at digitalenterprisesociety.org. Join us again next week for more connection without boundaries and creation without limits.